Good morning, Greg Howes. This is Morning Pulse. Welcome. Good to have you on with me this morning as we get our Friday started well. Excavating the Word of God, digging into some things in the Word. So let's check it out this morning, all right? So grateful to have you with me for a few minutes as we <clears throat> as we begin this day. Um, our cornerstone people, we are reading the Bible. Right now we're in the Gospel of Matthew, so continue with your Bible reading as we move forward with that. Uh, cornerstone people, tonight we have a movie night for young adults. This is for ages 18 to 25. So you're invited to come. You're supposed to wear your PJs, so be careful with that. But uh, <laughs> tonight, 7.30 p.m., 7.30 to 10, a young adults in the multi-purpose room, a night at the movies. That'll be good. Then tomorrow, uh, hold on just a second. Tomorrow, we have our Vanguard of Men meeting. Uh, you are significant, and we're going to be focusing on the shaking tomorrow. That's at 9.30 a.m. in the Cornerstone Annex for all of the men. You are significant. Then later on in the day, um, Chris Allen, Stacy Morphis are going to uh, take a group of men to uh, Bass Pro, the Bass Pro Shop to uh, check out some fishing gear. So Check that out. They're getting ready for the spring um, fishing trip. And it's going to be a, a great day for tomorrow for the men, 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. All right. And as usual, everything that we are doing is going towards the building of an established foundation, an apostolic foundation, a foundation that is sound, stable, and sure, secure, and it needs to be that way because we have a lot to build on top of that foundation. So everything we're doing right now is going toward the establishing of that firm foundation. All right, we're going to jump into what we have this morning. I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we will begin there. Now, we're going to cover a lot today, so get ready. Hopefully, we'll be able to get it into our time frame, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, Ephesians 4 is known a lot for the listing of the governmental gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, the equipping of the saints, all of that material in the middle of the chapter. But the beginning of the chapter out of the New International Version, Paul the Apostle says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then he goes on and he, he kind of gives us some clues of how to do that. He speaks about humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So you can see that all of those qualities, those components of living a worthy life, they, they imply that we have grown to a place of maturity. We've grown to a place of maturity. So you go down later on in Ephesians 4, down to verse 22, and he says, this is the New English translation, you were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside what he calls the old man, the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires. So the old man is a nature that is being corrupted. And then he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Then in verse 24, he says, put on what he calls the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth. So 
We're moving from the old man to the new man. Put off the old, put on the new. It's like taking off some old dirty clothes and then put on some brand new stylish clean clothes. The key to that change, that transformation, is in verse 23. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, there are things that happen in our lives. Uh, we get impacted by demonic power. We get impacted by uh, the evil that is in the world. We get impacted by our own uh, sinful desires. And all of those things want to drag us back to the old man. But we must stay with the new man by the decisions, the choices we make, by seeking after God. And the key again, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, being renewed in the spirit of your mind. So we have this, this pattern going on. The old man, and I'm again, I apologize. Sometimes you transfer these platforms, especially graphics like this, it gets kind of messed up, but you get the idea. The old man is a consciousness of lack, of losing, of fear, and of failure. That's our mindset in the old man. It's always about what I lack. It's always about what I'm losing. It's always about what I'm afraid of. It's always about fear. But then we come into this renew, renewing of the spirit of your mind, which is identification with Christ. Christ, the preeminent one, the eternal one, the anointed one. So we identify with Christ and we can do that by actions of water baptism. We're identifying with Christ, his resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, the communion, we may say ritual, where we are practicing the Lord's table, the bread and the cup. That's our identification with Christ and how we live our lives. So all of that is moving us now into this place of what scripture calls Completion in Christ. Completion in Christ, which is the new man. The new man. So we read this in Colossians chapter 2. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So this is the new man. We are complete in Christ Jesus. We've come out of lack. We've come out of fear. We've, we've come out of the mentality of losing. And now we've come into the place of identification with Christ, into the new man created in righteousness and holiness. That is where we want to live. So we are in this process. Our life is like a process. It's like a journey we're continuing on, we're advancing, we're making progress, we're always going forward. Process also means a course of action, a systematic sequence of actions or steps. And we're taking these steps to achieve a result. We're headed toward a destination. And all of this is in the context of time. Process means we are advancing during a period of time. This is why we need patience. This is why we need self-control, because we're always dealing with the passing of time, which gives us the impression that things are taking a long time. Whereas from God's view in eternity, it may not be that long at all. But from our view, as time is passing, whew, sometimes it can get difficult. So, we must not quit on the process. If you quit on the process, if you give up on the journey, if it seems like it's taking too much time and you just get tired and you quit, then you are quitting also on the result. You're never going to get the result if you quit on the process. So we want to continue on 
in that process. Now, here we go. And this is where it starts to get a bit more detailed. Ooh, I know you guys are ready for this. Come on, you're ready. This is where we're heading to maturity. In Exodus 25, God tells Moses, you're going to make me a sanctuary. And this sanctuary is going to have a pattern to it, a design, an order. He said, if you do it the way I tell you to do it, three things are going to happen. I will dwell with you. I will meet with you. I will speak with you. What could be better than that? We're going to have God dwelling with us, meeting with us, speaking with us. All of that is going to be happening. So if we do it according to the pattern, if we build our lives according to God's pattern, if we build the church according to God's pattern, if we build everything we're doing in life according to God's pattern, he will dwell with us, meet with us, and speak with us. So we're moving now, we're developing now from a place of chaos where there is disorder, there's no plan, there's no pattern. And whenever there's disorder, there will always be a struggle. You can't find something. You know, you lose your keys, uh, you lose your glasses, you lose, you lose something that's of value to you. Lose your wedding ring. You, you know, and it's always a struggle. It's always a struggle. How am I going to find the? How am I going to find my keys? And that's coming out of a place of disorder where there's no plan, there's no pattern. And so God is always moving us from chaos to order, from chaos to order. In the beginning, his spirit was hovering over the waters, and he said, let there be light, and there was light, and order begins to come. The arrangement, the assignment, the discipline, the rank. Order means to organize something. It means to regulate something. So God brings us out of chaos into order. And that always involves a design. A design implies architecture, arrangement. There's a blueprint. There are plans to follow. It's configuration. We're doing things according to the pattern. Doing things according to the pattern. And so we end up with this harmonious assembling of various parts in an orderly form designed for a common goal. So God says to Moses, you're going to, <clears throat> you're going to construct this tabernacle. You're going to put the tabernacle together according to the pattern. There will be no disorder. There will be no chaos. There will be no struggle with this. You're going to have a design. You're going to have a pattern. There will be an arranged, assigned order it's a design, there's a blueprint, and if you do it my way, it's going to get done and it'll be wonderful. So we see now this building of the tabernacle. Exodus 31, God calls a man named Bezalel, and the scripture says that God filled him with the spirit in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship to design and to work. Notice those two things, to design and to work. Now, when Bezalel designs, he's doing according to the pattern that God gave. He's designing and he's working. He's designing and he's working. So these are exactly the two things that we're doing as we build our lives, even as we are establishing ministry, business, church life. We're doing it to design. We're doing it to work according to God's pattern. And we must be filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God gives us wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and the skill, the capacity to design and to do the work. We skip now to Exodus 36, and we have Bezalel again, and now he has a partner with him, a Aholiab, and they have partners with them, every gifted artisan. And in these gifted artisans, these gifted designers and workers, the Lord put wisdom and understanding. Why? So they would know how. 
they would know how to do what God commanded them to do. And so now Moses calls Bezalel and Aholiab, these two chief architects, these chief designers, the contractors, and every gifted artisan. Watch this language. In whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. God put wisdom in them. God stirred their hearts, and they came to do the work. In Exodus 35, verse 4, Moses now speaks to the congregation, and he calls for an offering. And he said, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring. And you'll notice the colors, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, and goat's hair. That's an interesting phrase, goat's hair. Ram skins dyed red, badger skins, acacia wood, oil, spices, all of these things, sweet incense, the stones, the, the precious stones, Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. In verse 20, it says the congregation came around to bring their offerings. It said their hearts were stirred. Everyone whose spirit was willing, they came both men and women, down to verse 22, they came both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. They brought all of their offerings Verse 23, and every man who had blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, red skins of rams, and badger skins, he brought them. That becomes significant in just a moment. So we have all of this description continuing in verse in chapter 35 of Exodus. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands, brought what they had what they had spun, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, and all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. They spun yarn of goat's hair. Keep that in mind. Verse 29, again, they brought the offerings whose hearts were willing. So you're seeing a lot of language here. Hearts are being stirred. The word stir means to lift, to carry, to support, to sustain, to endure. When your heart is stirred, you're lifting something. You're willing to lift. You're willing to carry. You're willing to support. You're willing to sustain. You're willing to endure even through tough things. To stir means to kindle desire, to advance, to arise. Some of our Cornerstone people will remember uh, a few weeks ago, Anthony Earl was with us and he, he walked us quickly through these scriptures and, and gave us this, this insight of hearts being stirred. So in Exodus, in the establishing of the tabernacle, we see that God is looking for people whose heart is stirred. God is looking for people whose spirit is willing, and God is looking for people with a willing heart. A heart that's stirred, a spirit that's willing, and a willing heart. That's what God wants. That's what he's looking for in us. Is he finding that in us? Now, the goat's hair that was particularly deliberately mentioned, goat's hair, the women had wisdom to work with this difficult material. Goat's hair was tough, coarse. It was difficult to work with, but it was strong. So goat's hair was symbolic of humanity, yes, human form, people that are a little bit rough around the edges, difficult to work with, tough, but in that humanity, we find holiness, <laughs> holiness in the form of humanity, that God is able to take us, men and women, people, 
We may be tough. We may be rough around the edges. We may be difficult to work with. Our personalities may be coarse. We may, we may have all kinds of quirks and, and things going on in our lives. The people maybe would rather shy away from us than work with us. But when we are equipped to do the work of the ministry, we become the goat's hair that becomes strong and brings strong connection in the design of God. Ooh, I love it. So powerful. So powerful. So we move into the tabernacle. And we see the different elements of the tabernacle. First, the table of showbread. Or it's called the bread of God's presence. The bread of his presence. If you walk into the holy place, the inner place of the tabernacle, to the right you see the bread of his presence. And basically, the thought here is that we must have the presence of God with us. In Exodus 33, Moses and God go through this conversation where God says, you're going to go into the land, but I'm going to send my angel with you. I'm not going. He said, you guys are rebellious. You're stiff-necked. I- I'm not going up with you. I am not going. And then Moses comes back and he says, show me now your way. I want to know you. I want to find grace in your sight. And and then God finally says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses comes back and basically says, well, it's a good thing you said that because if you're not going with us, we're not going. That's basically what, what he says. If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. We need the presence of God. Whatever we're doing, wherever we're going, we need the presence of God. We need his presence. Then on the left-hand side is the lampstand. Exodus 27 gives the command about the lampstand. It's going to have oil of pressed olives. It's going to be oil for lighting the lamps. And the lamps are going to be kept burning 24-7. So we have the lampstand. It, it stands for light, for illumination, for revelation. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He's the the bread of the presence, but he's also the lampstand. He's also the light. I am the light of the world. We see him in Revelation walking among the lampstands, the seven churches. So this lampstand made of pure gold represents light, illumination, revelation. It's in the shape of a tree. And it has branches. You've seen the menorah, the lampstand of the Jewish people. That's what this is. It has the shape of a tree with almond branches. The almond is significant because in scripture, the almond tree is known as the waker. The waker. It's the first tree to bring forth fruit. It brings fruit forth early in its season. And so it becomes a sign that God is first to fulfill his promises. And the tree gives us the idea that there is a life giver involved. The tree is a life giver. So when we come to Jesus, the lampstand, we're receiving eternal life, eternal life. The waker. Remember in Jeremiah 1, God shows... uh, Jeremiah something. He wants Jeremiah to see something. And and he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see an almond tree. And God says, you've seen correctly because I'm about to bring forth what I have spoken. He's first to fulfill his promises. Then we go to the oil, the oil, the anointing, the anointing oil, the symbol of the Holy Spirit. The anointing takes us beyond our own ability empowering us with supernatural, divine ability. The oil comes from the crushing of olives, the olive press. So the question becomes, are we willing to experience the crushing process? Are we willing to go through that? 
when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, he was going through the olive press. Not my will, but yours be done. Whew. So we have the oil, supernatural power, ability, exceeding our natural abilities. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the incense, the altar of incense, just before the priest would move into the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. He came to the altar of incense, where incense was being offered up. The incense represents our worship and our prayer. Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer be set up before you as incense. The lifting of my hands is the evening sacrifice. If you could imagine when you're praying, there's incense flowing out of your heart, and that incense is going to the presence of God. You're lifting up your prayer, your worship to him. We see the same thing in Revelation 8. Another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. So we see this now incense intermingled with the prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So the incense is worship and prayer. It has a fragrance to it. 2 Corinthians 2 tells us that we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, the one that's perishing, we carry a fragrance that's translated as death. Smells like death. But to the one who is walking with God, we have an aroma, we have an, a fragrance of life. So that is the incense that we want to carry in our lives. The incense of worship and prayer, it's the fragrance of life and freedom. So remember that there's always a fragrance coming out of your spirit. What is that fragrance? What is that aroma? Evaluate the fragrance in your own life. And then finally, we come to the curtains. And I know we're going to go over time here, but hang in there with me. The curtains, are y'all hanging? Y'all tracking with me? The curtains represent degrees of separation. The veil separating the holy place from the outer court and the holy place from the most holy place. So as you went from the outer court into the holy place, you had to pass through a curtain. When the priest went from the holy place to the holy of holies, to the most holy place, he had to pass through another curtain. So these curtains are creating opportunities for intimacy. The focus shifting. Every curtain you pass through, every veil you move through, the focus is shifting from a horizontal experience dealing with the natural realm the physical realm, the earth realm, dealing with people, dealing with people business. And then we're moving to a vertical experience of a spiritual realm, moving in the power of the spirit, seeing what God is revealing and hearing what God is speaking. Not only do these curtains provide separation, but the curtains also provided protection and security. The covering over the top of the tabernacle was made of curtains. So here are the curtains of separation, the veil that was passed through. But then we have a covering over the top of the tabernacle. This is also made of the curtains. So if you're inside the tabernacle, and you're looking up, you're going to see something that's very beautiful, very ornate, very colorful, filled with design. But if you're on the outside of the tabernacle, you're going to see something that is very plain, of a heavy material, 
It's for protection. It's for covering. And that speaks to our spiritual nature, which is beautiful. It's the design of God. It's internal. But then the external, the human form, human flesh. We're just kind of plain. We have this treasure, this thing of beauty in earthen vessels, plain vessels. Yeah? So the curtains were also made as coverings over the tabernacle. So let's quickly look at this and we'll wind it up. The first curtain of covering, the internal covering over the top of the tabernacle is made of white, fine linen. It represents righteousness and purity. And it was linked together, sewn together with threads of blue, scarlet, and purple. The blue represents heaven and eternity. Blue, by the way, is the rarest color in nature. Look around at nature. You don't see too much that's blue. You see the sky. The sky can appear as blue. Sometimes water appears as blue. Blue represents the Son of God, heaven, eternity. But then scarlet represents redemption, man and blood. Man in his sin needs the blood of redemption. So here we see scarlet as Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And then we have a combination of blue and scarlet, heaven, and man in need of redemption gives us purple, which is the color of royalty, the color of the royal priesthood, purple being the most potent color on the spectrum. It has the highest light frequency, and purple represents Jesus as the king of kings. So all of this would be on the inside of the tabernacle as you're looking up at the what we would call the ceiling of the tabernacle. You're seeing the white, the blue, the scarlet, the purple. It's the covering. The second curtain of covering over top of that is the goat's hair. It's rough. It's rugged. It's a dark color. It represents humanity. Humanity. Then the third cur curtain of covering is the ram skin dyed red. It's over top of the goat's hair. The ram skin dyed red. It represents God's limitless love and the sacrifice, the shedding of blood. And then the fourth covering, the outside covering, the external covering is the badger skin, which is very tough. It's good for endurance. It endures any harsh weather patterns, and it represents protection. Protection. So this is all part of the design that God has given unto us, the design by which we build our lives, the design by which we move in agreement. How can two walk together unless they are agreed? We come into agreement with him. And we live in the blue of eternity, of heaven. We live in the scarlet of humanity in need of redemption. And we live in the purple. You are a royal priesthood. Ooh. Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's all there the anointing oil. We need the anointing. We need supernatural ability. The incense, our prayers, our worship being lifted up to God. The lampstand of revelation, illumination, light that's shining into our spirit man. The bread of his presence. We must have the presence of God. All of this is in God's design, his order. He brings us from chaos into his order. Okay, I'm done. I hope <laughs> I hope this is beneficial for you. I hope it makes sense that you're thinking through this 
Take this material, meditate on it. You might want to go back and watch this again. Meditate on it. Look up the scriptures for yourself. Do some study for yourself and see what God is revealing to you. You're going to have a great day today. You're going to have a great weekend. Get in church somewhere this weekend. You need to be in the koinonia, the communion, the common union. Well, you need to be in the fellowship of the saints. So make sure that you get involved with that. Yeah, I declare everything you put your hands on today is going to prosper. It's going to be successful. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'll talk to you soon.